So let and allow right now your heart to be ministered to, not by man, but by the Spirit of the Lord. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We give you all the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, that we haven't come to hear from a man, but we have come to hear, Lord, from you in this house. We have come to hear from your teacher, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for all the churches across this valley, also around the planet, that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, this is, mm, this is your time with your people. And I bless those churches. We don't think of ourselves, Lord, as better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours, Jesus. Building your kingdom. That's what we do in this house, is build your kingdom by building your people. And Father, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory. As you bless all those other churches, bless this one also. In Jesus' mighty name, here's our heart. Fill it with your will and your way and your want for your love for us. And we give you the praise. Jesus' mighty name. Everybody shout, amen. <laughs> Let's try that again. Everybody shout, amen. My goodness, it's good to be in the house of the Lord with you. Listen, a couple of verses tonight we're going to take out of 1 Peter, 2nd chapter, if you want to go there in your Bible. And then... In the Gospel of John, first chapter, the Gospel of John, first chapter, if you want to mark those, it'd be kind of fun. We're going to just go and look at some scripture, contrasting verses. I think sometimes I want to just share this with you. There is no way in the world I can get you, nor do I want you to think like me. And I don't know if this is a revelation to you or not. There ain't no way I'm going to start thinking like you. And I want you to know that we all think differently. We all see things differently. We all perceive things differently. And for man to stand in front of you and try to get you to think like he thinks is like the stupidest thing in the world. That is not what God calls pastors to do. But for someone to stand in front of you and try to get you to think like God thinks having and taking on the mind of Christ changes the world that you live in. In other words, a lot of us live with issues in life. In this room right now, if you just looked around, there's all kinds of issues. Some of you are young and got issues. And I don't know what brought those issues around. I don't know if it was parents or siblings. I don't have any idea. Maybe you're a little bit older and it was school teachers or classmates. I have no idea why... People have issues, have issues of insecurities, issues about frustrations and anxieties. People have issues about anger and issues about life in general. They have distrust. There's people in this room tonight that are filled with all kinds of distrust about everything. And people literally act out their life based oftentimes on how they perceive themselves. Let me say that again. People oftentimes will act out their life, complete their life, fulfill their life, do stuff in their life based on how they see themselves. If they see themselves negative or discouraged or frustrated or without any value at all, then they'll do something either to try to get that value on their own or they will be so beat down they'll never accomplish, do anything. And we see that constantly. And this mindset that you have and this mindset that I have is something really unique because it really guides us. It's like a, if you will, it's like it sets a blueprint for us to live out our life. What would it be like if I and you took on the, which Bible says we can and are, take on the mind of Christ and we start thinking about ourselves, not on based on what we feel or what we think, are based on our issues or our past experiences that may have conditioned us to be a certain way, but we really, with our own mindset, started taking on the mind of Christ. What God thinks about us, what God expects to do in us, what God wants to fulfill through us. 
And a lot of times, people don't ever see that. They stop with themselves, and they say, God, come fix me. And God is saying, listen, I am the one who will erase every issue in your life if you'll let me. I'll be like a big blackboard or a whiteboard, whatever you want to look at and see. I'll come in and I will wash that, all the old things against you, all of the stuff that was in your issue problems in the past. And with Christ, you can literally start over. But the problem with it is, is most people don't start over. They start where they're at. They start their thinking. They don't ever get rid of that old stupid thinking. They don't ever get rid of those issues. They don't really get rid of that temper, those angers, that anxiety, that uh, lack of security, that insecurity that they live in all the time and, and just hate themselves for it. A lot of people come to church because they want Christ and they know Christ can help them, but they don't let Christ help them. And the only way Christ's gonna help you and I is if we change what we think about ourselves and we start to think what he says. Has anybody got that? We start to change. We make the effort. We say to ourselves, here we are. I don't know why I'm the way I am. I don't know if it was my mom. I don't know if it was my dad. I don't know if it was my big brother who beat me up all the time. I have no idea why the issues that I have issues. But, you know, if I can get rid of these issues, and here's the deal. I do one thing, promise you, you get rid of the issues. And I promise you this, if you're a young person and you don't get rid of the issues when you're young, they're 10 times worse when you're older. Because then they get a hold of you in such a way that it's almost an impossibility to get rid of it. And you know, a lot of times we do, we, we live out life based on how we perceive ourselves. Well, what if you started living out life based on how God perceives you, how God sees you? And what if, you, what if it had nothing to do with how you feel? God just wants to wipe away the past and start fresh with you by changing how you think about yourself. And these contrasting verses in 1 Peter, here we find Peter writing these, and I thought they were fascinating. And they're contrasting because at first he talks about people who don't believe. And he actually calls the people that don't believe in the world, disobedient, which is really fascinating. But let me just share this with you, if I may. It's kind of fascinating because the people in this world don't realize that Jesus Christ died for everybody. And access to him is for everybody. Now, if you don't access him, if you don't go to him, in other words, if I gave you a billion dollars and, and you didn't go get it out of the bank or know how to get it out of the bank, it wouldn't do you any good at all. So here's Jesus giving his life for everybody on this planet, but a lot of people don't know how to access the future that he has for them because they're all wrapped up in their past, they're all wrapped up in themselves, they're all wrapped up in their own issues and the things that keep them from absolutely being blessed in their life in every area. And so that's what we're going to talk about. That's what we're going to see. So in 1 Peter, the sec, uh, let's take a look at the second chapter of 1 Peter. And I want to start really with some, some really great verses here in 1 Peter, the second chapter. In verse, verse number 7, let's take a look at it. And remember, these are contrasting verses. And he's really starting to tell a story about two types of people, people that are believers and people who are non-believers, people who are obedient to things of God and people who are not obedient to things of God. Hey, in this room, there are two types of people. There are people that are believers, non-believers. There are people that are obedient and there are people that are <clears throat> just simply disobedient. Doesn't matter if you got Christ in your mind or not. There's two types of people, that's them. And he describes them here as Peter writes this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He writes this and it is, listen to this, not only pinned, but it's been preserved for thousands of years for you. That's what a lot of people don't understand. This is just not something that was written by some goofball that wrote something down and somebody made something out of it. Man, this is thousands of years 
worth of tried scripture that's proved itself to be true. Thousands of years at the, listen to this, at the expense of millions probably of people who died to protect this so you could find out how to get out of your issues tonight. That's pretty bizarre. So let's read. Start in verse number, let's start step seven. <clears throat> Therefore, to you who believe, and I love this, he is, what's that word? Precious. What's that word? Precious. Yeah, one more time. To you who believe, he is. Precious. Now stop thinking about it. That says a lot right there. There's a lot of people who say, I believe in Jesus, but he's not precious to them. Precious is something that has enormous value. If I, if I gave you a diamond that was 10, 20 carats, let's say, put it in a little blue bag and carry it out of here tonight, you would not throw it around in your back seat. Pick it up a couple of weeks from now. It's worth $50 million and you would, it'd be so precious to you, man, you would watch it, you would guard it, you would protect it, it would be part of you, you do everything. That word is a big word. To those that believe, he is precious. That means the people that don't believe, he's not precious. There's no value. He's there. He's just somebody that I was hurt, told about. He's just out there somewhere. And I, 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 I believe I've heard the Christmas stories or the Easter stories, and, and I believe that, but he hasn't yet in my heart become precious, valuable to me. And anything that's precious would be protected. My wife's precious. I protect her. I protect her so much I drive her nuts. I mean, I am just like all over her all the time. Now, do this, do that, do that. She says, okay, Dad, I'm like not four years old. Of course, she doesn't do it, and then I realize that she needed to follow what I said. But don't tell her I said that. <laughs> Therefore, to, to who believe he is precious. And then here's where the contrast comes in. Watch this. See the word but there? But to those who are disobedient, one translation says unbelievers are disbelievers. So those who are unbelievers or disbelievers are disobedient to what God did for every man on the planet. And you can still come into the place where you realize there's something going on, disobedient. And then he says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. When you read that, sometimes people don't understand what that means. In those days, the chief cornerstone was what they built from. You had a cornerstone and the rest of the house was built from it. It was made out of stones. The stone had to be perfect in its size, had to be perfect in its, in its, uh, in its uh, position, and it had to be as plumb as it could possibly be so you got a real good fix on what the rest of the house is like. So here... This statement comes along. It's a statement a lot of people that are Christians read. They don't quite understand it. And it, let's read it. He says, the stone which the builders rejected. Israel, the Jewish people, when he came, totally and completely rejected him. The Pharisees and the scribes and the high priest said, no way. You're not the Messiah. Not a chance. You're not it. They've rejected him. And when they rejected him, the chief cornerstone, listen to this, he became the chief cornerstone. He's the one that builds the life. He's the one that builds the house. If you want to have a house that is true, you want to have a life that is perfect, you want to build your marriage, you want to build your children, you want to build your job, you want to build everything, you have to build it on the chief cornerstone. Guess whose name that is? It's Jesus. See? And the rest of the world has rejected him, but you have it. Therefore, that makes you different than them. But oftentimes with our issues, we don't act any different than they do. Verse number eight comes along, makes this statement. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. In other words, boy, here's this chief cornerstone. How many people have a hard time with the name Jesus? They're just trying to get it out of everything. They got it out of Christmas. Trying to get, they got it out of the schools. They get it out of everything. <clears throat> it is a rock a chief cornerstone, but became an offense to those that are disobedient, those that are non-believers, those that want a part of it. <clears throat> and then he comes along and he says this, being disobedient to the word 
in which they also were appointed. That, that's a powerful statement. Now watch this. Being disobedient to the word to which they also, they also, they, the rest of the world also were appointed. Jesus came, he died in that cross for every single man, woman, child. Do you know that not every man, woman, and child want anything to do with it? Don't believe it? Think you're nuts to follow such a thing? Forget it, I'm away from it, and there's such a difference. He comes along and he makes that statement. He says this, they, they stumble over those things. <clears throat> Which is really fascinating. Peter's writing this. And so hold your place, Peter. We'll come right back. But I want you to go to the Gospel of John. John, the first chapter. And John, the first chapter, talking about something really fascinating. And as John starts to write, he starts to write about Jesus being the Word. And he makes a statement about, if you will, in the first chapter, about John the Baptist. Remember, John the Baptist wasn't the light, but he was a witness of the light. Does anybody remember that? Am I making you crazy by saying that? I hope not. I hope you're smart enough to remember that. And then he comes along. In other words, John the Baptist came first to tell everybody about Jesus that was coming. That's what that's all about. But he wasn't the light. And then it goes on. And this verse, it's just a powerful verse. In verse number nine, it says this in John Gospel, chapter number one, verse number nine. Remember, we're talking about the whole world rejecting him. We're talking about Peter says, he, they, Jesus became the stumbling block. Can I tell you something? Some of you that are in here, Jesus will become the stumbling block of your future. Stumbling block means here's the right way to build your house. You won't want to do it and you will trip over the right way. And you don't have to do that, but you will. And so I hope you're hooked and nipped with this because I want you to see this. And he makes this statement in the ninth verse and he says these words, chapter number one, that was a true light. Notice the word, <clears throat> if you will, true light speaking of Jesus, which gives light to... See, he gives light to... Let's try it one more time. He gives light, Jesus, the true light, gives light to... Every man. So then why isn't every man turned on? Why doesn't every man deal with his issues or build his house or build his life based on that chief cornerstone? No, no, they're stumbling over it. And we can call ourselves Christians and still stumble over the cornerstone. Is anybody listening? Who which gives light to every man coming into the world. And someone says, well, I mean, what if they don't hear about Jesus? All you have to do is look around. You see the snow level at a certain level. You see the beauty of the sky. You see the sunset. Romans, the first chapter, says, man, there's nobody with an excuse because you can just see all of the Trinity, all the Godhead, all God, Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, all in the world that you live in. You know, and it's just out there. And he says, for every man that comes in this world, they know there's a God. And you can either run from it or not run from it. Here's what happens. When you run from it, he becomes a stumbling block and you never deal with your issues. Interesting. Verse number 10. <clears throat> he says, he was in the world and the world was made through him. Wow, obvious. Romans first chapter tells us that. And the world did not and the world did not If the world did not know him, how are they going to follow him? So he becomes the stumbling block to their life. Why? Because they were disobedient to what God the Father sent, which is his son. Everything you'll ever need, my friends, hear me, let me say it again. Everything you'll ever need is found in Let's try this side. Everything you'll ever need, my friends, let me say it like this. Everything you'll ever need is found in and that's what a lot of times, so if you've got hang-ups, issues, things that you're trying to deal with, you deal with them through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You settle in him and you deal with the rest of the world didn't know him. But you call yourself a Christian and you're here tonight, you're here because you want to know something about him so you don't have those issues so that you can prosper and be successful in life. Come on, don't tell me you don't want to be. 
God wants you to be successful. God wants you to prosper. God wants you to have life. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give it more abundant. He didn't come to be a big killjoy. He didn't come to take from you. He came to give you real life. And the people that don't believe make their real life based on themselves and have issues. That's why you see people, rock stars with like a zillion dollars and they kill themselves with overdoses. You see movie stars failing and going creepy on you all the time because they have all the material stuff. They made themselves something, but they never found what they were looking for, which was the connection with God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and of the earth. Verse number 11 says he came to his own, that's those scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and high priest, his people, the Jewish people, the nation. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. Here's a question I, will you receive him? You say, well, pastor, I've already born again. I, I've already headed for heaven. That's great. But you know, there's more than just heaven. You ever notice how God left you here? There's a life to live. There's a life God wants you to live that's abundant and blessed in such a way free, in such a way that you become a witness to a lost and dying world that's been stumbling over the cornerstone. <laughs> My goodness sakes alive. Verse number 12, but as many as received him, I hope that's you, to him they gave the right to become, to them they, those that receive him. Now you gotta get this verse. Those that received him, those of you that haven't yet, we'll make sure at the end you'll get him. But those that received him, there's a right given to you to become a child of God. So you're sitting there saying, man, I got problems. I got issues. My mom and dad were bad to me. My uncle came through the door at the night when I was 11 years old and violated me. My big brother beat me up and I'm afraid of this and I'm fearful of that and I didn't get an education and I'm not very smart and I'm not very good and I'm, I have nervous habits and I have these issues about this issues and about this issues. I don't feel very secure. I feel like people are judging me. I judge myself. I hate myself. And many of you in here said you would like to die. And you know it. And I'm not asking you to raise your hand because I don't give flip tonight. It's your night of life. Are you hearing me? But here's the deal. <clears throat> and you've been so depressed with yourself that some of you have tried to kill yourself. Some of you wish you would die. But listen to what it says. God gives you that if you believe, you receive him. Guess what happens? He says he gives you the right to become a child of God. And those who believe in his name I mean, that is an amazing statement that God would allow you to become a child of God. Listen to these words in verse, if you will, in verse number 13. It says, who were born not of blood. You're not giving a flip about you being born of blood. Or the will of the flesh. Don't give a flip about the will of the flesh. Or the will of man. <clears throat> no. But if you're born of God, then you become a child of God. And now that you're a child of God, according to what we just read, you got rights. And if you apply those rights, your whole perception about yourself changes. Instead of being down and discouraged and frustrated and a loser, Instead of never being able to accomplish anything because you're not smart enough, you're not thin enough, you don't fit in, you're, you're, you feel bad about yourself, you feel like nobody likes you, whatever the issue might possibly be, all of a sudden you're a child of God. And when you're a child of God, that means God lives in you and God wants to back your future. A lot of times people don't come to church all the time, don't understand that. So with that in mind, and I love this, Go back with me now. First Peter, second chapter, verse number nine. Is anybody listening tonight? Yes. <clears throat> First Peter, the second chapter, verse number nine. And I want to read you something. The contrast was those that didn't believe, those that rejected, and those were disobedient to those that do believe and are not disobedient 
and are obedient and now receive Christ and that are born of the Spirit of God, not just of the flesh of the body. That you become the child of God. They're the losers, but you become the child of God. Therefore, God sees you and me in a different light. And this is where the rubber meets the road is these next few verses. Verse number nine, he says this word. But you, someone say me. me. When I said when you, that meant you. So point at yourself like this, look at me, and go me. me. This verse talked about you. Well, let's everybody do that because you need to do this because, you know, some of you are looking at me like you just saw, you know, a, a new gate near a cow in a field or something. You're like staring at me. Okay, but here, uh, you are, listen to these words, a chosen generation where the word you means really you. So everybody say me. Watch this. One, two, three. Me. Remember, there's those that are disobedient that get nothing. And there's those that say, I want to receive Christ and get out of these bad, ugly things that are ahead for me. So here's how that works. I'm telling you, point at yourself and say, me, and half of you are going, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You know, disobedience. You want to try it again or should we just stare at each other? <laughs> All right, let's try it again. See who's obedient and who's disobedient. If you can't even be obedient to a simple request like I'm giving you, what happens when God speaks to you? You know what I'm saying? So I'm just saying, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but I tell you when it says you are a chosen generation, he's really talking about you, which you ought to say to yourself on three, point at yourself and go, me, watch this, one, two, three, me. This refers to you. You might be someday in the sweet by and by when you die and go to heaven. How about this one? When you get smart. How about when you get pretty? I mean, there's some of the ugliest people in the whole world in this building. God doesn't care. He sees you all looking like him, the most beautiful people on the planet. Are you following me? He says, you are, <laughs> you are a chosen. I mean, God chose you. And the word chosen is a funny word. If you really play the word out and really meditate the word, the word chosen doesn't mean like God picked you for the team and that's it and, you know, you're on the team. It really means you're picked and you responded. So God picked you, but in order to be fully chosen, you have to respond or receive. Is that, is that cool? So he says the ones that are faithful, that are called in Revelation, they're chosen generation. You're a chosen generation. God sees you as somebody that says, she belongs to me. God sees he belongs to me. I don't care what happened in his life. I don't care what sin was in the past. I don't care what vicious things he's done. I don't care how many times he's failed. I don't care how many commitments. He, he, he belongs to me. I chose him, and then him needs to respond. That's chosen generation. There's a new time. We're part of this generation together, whether you like it or not. I know everybody likes to identify, but I'm a millennial, I'm a, I'm a whatever, and I have no idea what I am. I'm like, I'm like, I'm, I'm in the ancient group, you know? And so I don't, you know, don't give a flip because I'm just gonna see Jesus sooner than you, that's all. <laughs> don't cry over me. Say, oh, hallelujah, that man's having revival. And I'll be the one following him around up there because that's all I want to do is follow him around. I, I, you can have my mansion. I don't give a flip about the mansion. I don't give a flip about the golden streets. I don't give a flip about the pearls. I don't give a flip about all that rich. I just want to see Jesus. You know what I mean? I give a flip about that stuff. Jeez. Well, you got a mansion waiting for you. I could give a, you know what, man? If I have a trailer that's following Jesus, I don't care. 
Give me a little trailer. You see, you see a little trailer following Jesus? Pastor Jim's in that trailer. <laughs> How do you know? I know he is. Just wait and say, I'll just wave at you as I go by. <laughs> Could give a flip about that stuff. I just want to be near Jesus. Tell you what, listen to this. He said, but you're a chosen. And then he makes a statement that is nuts about you. Now think about this. Everybody calls you a dirtbag, a loser, a failure. You know, you're not educated. You'll never be anything. Your boss picks on you. If you ever tried, maybe in the army, your sergeant tore you up in the army, whatever it is. Your school teachers. You know what my school teacher said about me? I was in the fifth grade. They, she said, <clears throat> you're so, in front of the whole class. She said, you're so stupid that you are, the, have the IQ of a plant. And everybody laughed. And I thought that was funny. And then she says, no, no, you're a virus. It's lower than a plant. Everybody laughed and I laughed. I became the class clown. To this day, at 72 years old, I remember, I'm going to get her. <laughs> no, no, not out of chance, man. You know, what people say about you, I don't give a flip. Doesn't matter what, because you get a hold of God on the inside, change everything. Even, even, even change your attitudes towards stupid teachers. I mean, uh, that, uh, that. I'll never forget her, Miss Porter. God, Miss Porter in heaven, I ain't coming. <laughs> no, see, I've changed. I've changed. <laughs> I'm playing with you now. Don't run out of here and say stuff about me like that. He goes, I'm playing with you. You understand that? A, cho- a royal priesthood. Did you know there's no such thing? There's only two in the Bible. Melchizedek, who is both king and priest. And the other one is Jesus. He's King Jesus and the high priest. Only two. Did you know that? But there's a third one, and it's you. Wait a minute. It says that in Revelation. It's saying that in 1 Peter, that you are a royal. That means kingly. And you are a priesthood. And David had a predecessor. His name was Saul. And when, if you find out, when you read your scripture, you find out that Saul did the sacrifices of Samuel because Samuel was late. And man, it cost him everything. He was not allowed to do that. You're either king or you're priest. And that's why you have this. But us, in the family of God, born of the spirit of God, listen to this, you're both king (laughs) and priest. Oh my goodness sakes alive. See, you're not a loser, you're not a failure, you're not a, a weirdo. You're, there's, uh, you got, maybe you got hang-ups, but you don't have to keep them. You know what I'm saying? Maybe, maybe you're, you're dumb, but you don't have to stay dumb. Maybe you're an old drunk, you don't have to be a drunk. Maybe you're a drug dealer. I don't know, maybe you're on porn. I don't know what you are. I know there ain't no porn stars in here. Well, maybe you're on porn. I don't know what you are, but you don't have to stay on porn because you're a royal priesthood to God. Now, everybody, everybody, now this is everybody in the world's going to tell you different than that. Your family's going to tell you different than that. Your exes, anybody got exes? Your exes will call you things different than that. Oh, my goodness sakes alive. But guess what? God sees you. Remember what I'm talking about? If you can get your thinking like he thinks and he sees you instead of how you see yourself, it changes the whole world. You are kings and priests sitting in there. You are the most valuable commodity on the planet. There isn't anything you can't accomplish. Doesn't matter. You said, Patrick, you don't understand. I don't have much of an IQ. Good. It just gives God more room to do great things. The dumber you are, the greater your God is. A holy nation. Oh, my goodness. He's, just remember, get your thinking around. A holy nation means a group of people set aside for God's use. That's what holy means. Set aside. I'm set aside for God's use. Can you imagine that? I, I, when I found this out, remember, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I was like as dumb as a sack of rocks. And I just read my Bible. And I said, oh my goodness, Lord. I, I'm a set aside for your work. I'm set aside for you. 
I'm not set aside for the world. I'm not a set aside to be a loser. I, I'm set aside for you. And there's a whole nation of us. You understand how special you really are. That's why I didn't tell you the title of the message is You Are Special, but I forgot to tell you. <laughs> then he goes on and he says, His own special people. One translation says, Peculiar. Well, I tell you what, some Christians are really, uh, not everybody, but some Christians are really peculiar. I mean, really peculiar. Like, really peculiar. That guy is really weird. But he's so fired up for Jesus, man, you just hang around him and you get happy. You ought to all take him out to dinner and just let it rub all over you. Some of you need this smile. I, I, I've been asking, me, Dennis, how many, how many times, how many years you've been answering me? I'd say, Dennis, how are you? Hey, wait a minute, when I said that, Dennis, how are you? For the last 15 years, I'm telling you, I slap myself in the face and say, why did I ask him? I don't want to know how you are. I mean, the guy is up all the time. It's like somebody please bacon grease on him or something to turn him off. He can't turn him off at all. Dennis, shout it out to me. How are you? Fantabulous. Somebody meet him at his car and beat the crap out of him, will you? He's driving me nuts. Fantabulous. I've heard fantabulous all about We're weird people. We get filled up with God, man. We're different. Stop trying to be like the world. Stop trying to think like the world. Sorry, Dennis, I did had to pick you on you. Doesn't matter what I say about you, you're still gonna be happy and still be fantabulous, but you don't know how much I do think of you. You're wonderful. I'm just not asking you that question ever again. <laughs> so here he comes along, he makes this strange, peculiar. Hey guys, if you're a Christian, you're different. It's okay. Hello? We're Christians and we are weird to those that stumbled over the obvious. That's Jesus. We're different than them because we accept him. The rest of them rejected him. And they're the ones stumbling, but we're the ones getting blessed. Come on, somebody. Then he comes along and he says this that you may proclaim the praises of him. Why would you praise him unless there's good things coming in your life? I praise God, man, oh, when something good happens. So all of a sudden, God who blesses me because I'm in him and I'm receiving him and I'm a child of God, like he said, with rights, my goodness sakes, I can proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into a marvelous light. How many of you know you've been called out of darkness into the light of God? Come on, that is really a good feeling. Those of you who can't raise your hand on that one, you can raise your hand in a few minutes. Verse number 10, do we have verse number 10 up there? It says, who once were not a people. That one drives me nuts. If we once were not a people, what were we? Losers. Is that not true? Is anybody in here be real? I mean, you didn't get born and all of a sudden you're perfect. You, did you ever notice you got born you're a mess? First thing you did was cry. Slobber all over yourself. Is that not true? I mean, you're a mess. So here he comes along and he says this, we've been delivered out of darkness and brought into this place. A people that now, a people of God that had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. God's mercy. Why let the hangups of the past keep you from the blessings of the future? Come on, we all have hangups. We all have problems. We all have issues. We all look at ourselves and feel like we just can't do it. But here's the truth. With God, all things are possible. In fact, the Bible says nothing is impossible to him that 
Let's try it again. That's the first three rows. Nothing's impossible to him that believes. So the question is whether or not you're a believer or disobedient to get rid of all the issues so you can be filled and happy and blessed in your life in every area of your life. My goodness sakes alive. I love this because it's so real. Let me just conclude with these next verse, if I may. Verse number 11. Beloved, this is what caught my attention. The Holy Spirit writes this, yes, through men, but this is an inspired word of God. This means that God is writing this to you. And he says these words. Beloved, I beg you. Can you imagine God begging you to come into alliance of what he says about you instead of what you think about yourself or what other people say about you? I beg you. As sojourners and pilgrims, in other words, <clears throat> you're only passing through this place. Why do you put so much emphasis on this place? It's not that you can't, but you're just passing through. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. In other words, why let the flesh tell you how to feel? Why not let the fact of who you are tell you how you feel? The flesh says, I don't feel good today. The flesh says, I'm weak today. The flesh says, I can't do it today. The flesh says, I'm no good. The flesh says, I've been poisoned. The flesh says, nobody loves me. Nobody cares about me. I feel like, oh, the flesh, 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 flesh. Why do you let the flesh come against your soul like that? Verse 12. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. That when they speak against you as an evildoer, don't they always talk about us as if we're wrong, as if we've done something wrong? Watch this. That they may by good works, your good works, your good works, which they observed, glorify God on the day of visitation. God's coming, and they're going to remember your good works. That's what he just said. Look, I'm finished for tonight. But I want you to hear what I'm going to say to you. You have issues because you think too much about getting rid of the issues with your ability. And the older you get, the more convinced you are that you can get rid of the issues with your ability. You will never get rid of the issues with your ability. You only get rid of the issues with his ability. And that's what this is all about. You are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. And you are fantabulous. No matter who said you were ugly tonight. You're not. You're the most beautiful people and the most valuable people on the planet. God paid the highest price for you, brought you into his family, and now he says, you're special and you're mine. Live like you're mine. Don't live like you're your own. If God spoke to you tonight, give the Lord a great big praise for you.